and uh, such a great introduction to topic itself. I think uh, it's uh, it's very well said that uh, not just India. Now we know how important these pandemics are and why we really need to look at wildlife hosts and reservoirs and understand what's really going on uh, in these wildlife species when it comes to various uh, Disease, diseases and infections that are transmitting between these wildlife. So let me just go ahead and start sharing my screen and my presentation with you all. OK, so as as Dr. Kolangat said that today's talk, I'm going to uh, really discuss about what's the role of veterinarians in preventing future pandemics. And more importantly, I'll be talking about wildlife veterinarians. I think uh, all of you who are participating in this webinar are in one way or the other interested in wildlife health, uh, wildlife diseases and disease ecology uh, that we uh, try to study in wildlife species. Uh, during uh, today's talk, uh, I think what I will try to do is basically first, uh, I'll just briefly introduce you to some of the key outbreaks, key pandemics that we have actually very recently uh, have been facing in last probably couple of decades. Uh, of course, there's a great example that we are right now living through a pandemic. Uh, that is also uh, very contextual to this uh, specific uh, uh, topic that we are covering today. But even besides that, we have been actually in last couple of decades uh, suffering a lot from diseases that come from wildlife and have have been our lives have already been affected even before the COVID-19 pandemic started. Uh, after those examples, uh, I'll briefly go through a little bit of theory about uh, how zoonosis works, how people have been trying to understand the epidemiology of zoonotic diseases coming from wildlife. And following that, I'll try to uh, explain a, a big project that I'm fortunate enough to be part of that is trying to do surveillance at a global scale to understand uh, emerging threats from wildlife. Uh, this will include some uh, smaller examples of different studies. Uh, some, some of them are field studies, some of them are purely epidemiological studies, some of them are uh, mathematical modeling studies, uh, some of them are even, uh, even machine learning studies. So it's, it's really interesting how uh, a topic that is very close to veterinarians can become very quickly become a multidisciplinary. So let's start with the uh, uh, with today's presentation. This this is uh, these are two two figures from a very seminal paper that probably came I guess in 2008 in uh, the journal called as Nature, which is very reputed journal, and this uh, probably was. Uh, some of the first few papers that started talking about emerging viruses and emerging uh, pathogens from wildlife. As you can see here on the left, uh, there are different numbers of uh, emerging infectious disease events that are being shown uh, on the bar plots over here. And if we really just look at uh, how many of those emerging disease infectious events are happening because of viruses, you can see that this is this is represented by the white part of those bar plots and you can see that majority of them uh, after bacteria and rickettsial organisms are caused due to viruses and if you see this plot over here where they are trying to show which of those emerging events have zoonosis are zoonotic in nature and come from wildlife as you can see again the a lot of a bunch of it actually uh, has been ascribed to uh, wildlife hosts. Uh, so uh, you can see that uh, emerging viruses from wildlife is kind of a really uh, an important aspect of this, uh, of em emerging, uh, emerging uh, diseases for humans. And you can just see the global distribution of uh, these emerging uh, uh, infectious disease events, uh, and it's everywhere. This this map just shows uh, uh, the reports of emerging disease events. Uh, you need to really understand uh, one thing over here is that these kinds of data are kind of biased most of the times because uh, you will have more observations in the region where you're doing more studies. And obviously in most of the uh, uh, developed nations where there are so many resources to do these kind of studies, 
you will have more studies, hence more uh, disease detection events. So as you can see, uh, even though you, you uh, all these disease uh, uh, emerging disease events are uh, all across the world, most of them are concentrated uh, in the in Europe and in North America, where quite a lot of studies have uh, are still being conducted. So let's take the first example of Ebola viruses. Ebola viruses are uh, we know we just before COVID uh, COVID nineteen pandemic started officially, I guess. Uh, there were a few, few, few weeks or few months uh, before that. We kind of, uh, I think, WHO kind of declared that we are out of the outbreak that was going on in uh, West Africa of uh, Ebola virus. And uh, Ebola viruses are just not one virus. It's uh, there are seven now. There are seven uh, identified Ebola viruses and uh, uh, viruses for from Filoviridae family itself. They all are public health uh, uh, concern of public health importance. So uh, as you can see that even though we have uh, identified the Ebola virus way before, I guess in almost 1970s, we had first detected the Ebola virus and we have been seeing smaller outbreaks of this disease in Africa, in Central Africa in, and in uh, West Africa but we yet are not able to identify what are their hosts and where is it exactly coming from, even though we have an overall idea that um, most of these Ebola viruses tend to live in bats and then they use some uh, some ungulate species or some uh, other species to jump and amplify and then those species, the secondary hosts can tend to tend to act as source for humans to start an outbreak. So uh, this is uh, one of the crucial stories that has triggered a lot of lot of research with respect to emerging viruses from wildlife. Uh, take another example. Just just four years ago, uh, there was a big outbreak of Zika virus in uh, South America, especially in Brazil. But uh, the story of Zika virus doesn't start uh, there. We know Zika virus almost uh, since 1947 when there was a big um, Flaviviral research that was uh, funded by Rockefeller Foundation here in the United States uh, to go out in the wild all across the world and start uh, collecting uh, samples to identify new pathogens. And that's when we probably first time uh, detected a Zika virus in monkeys. Uh, but since then, it has actually spread across the world and we are still not able to contain it. So it's almost 70 years that we are trying to uh, trying to control this virus. So uh, it, it, it uh, later on in in the 2000s, the virus kind of emerged in uh, Oceania uh, in uh, Australia and nearby islands. And then as we know that a big outbreak that happened in 2015 and 2016 in South America that took over the news and that again brought into flaviviruses. So flaviviruses is a big genus of uh, viruses, most of which are uh, most of which are um, uh, vector borne viruses like uh, transmitted by either mosquitoes or ticks, uh, out of which Zika is one of the viruses. And uh, I would like to actually start uh, mention a great story over here, especially for audiences uh, that are from India, uh, is that this project that basically uh, did the discovery of Zika virus uh, in in Africa uh, in 1950s uh, is the same project that was trying to uh, that invested a lot of money in the research uh, just I think in just uh, during the same decade 1950s or early 1960s uh, to start some surveillance regarding uh, regarding a fever uh, fever like illness that was being reported in Karnataka a state of Mar uh, state of India and uh, that was probably uh, the very first one health type of surveillance that was being conducted in india where we were trying to uh, understand the wildlife host of a specific disease and uh, they they did quite a lot of surveillance with respect to ticks uh, that were in 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 the forest region of shimoga uh, they tried sampling various bird species to see if the virus is uh, circulating in those species and eventually they realized that uh, the virus was kind of circulating in the primates of that region 
and that virus is which is another flavivirus is now we call it as Kayasnul forest disease or KFD. And uh, that is when the uh, discovery of KF KFD happened and India is still trying to uh, control that disease, even though disease that disease is quite endemic in uh, in South India and probably comes uh, probably the northern distribution of the diseases until uh, Maharashtra. There has been some serological evidence uh, of that uh, uh, that were uh, in Maharashtra, uh, even though it's quite endemic to that region, but we're still struggling to control that disease. And uh, this this establishment, this investment of a research uh, that happened during that time actually led to establishment of uh, that lab eventually became uh, the National Institute of Virology uh, of India, which is now uh, a big lab in India and doing quite a lot of uh, great research with respect to viruses, not just from not just from animals, but from plants uh, and everywhere. So that's how the, that's a nice anecdotal story that I wanted to share with you all. Uh, and then another great example of influenza viruses. I think uh, the reason I want to just uh, just start show this example of influenza viruses is that uh, all of us know that influenza viruses are kind of harbored by uh, wild birds uh, and then they can be taken from one place to other uh, during their migration. And probably I want to share this story uh, mostly because uh, uh, during 2005, uh, India kind of experienced its first outbreak of avian influenza H5N1, and uh, that kind of piqued my personal interest in epidemiology and disease ecology. So, uh, and that's how I started uh, uh, involving myself into uh, disease ecology work where I was part of uh, some great surveillance team uh, that was being um, uh, that was working uh, to identify the reservoirs in India. So uh, that that's another uh, a looming threat on on the world, and uh, we have seen that uh, uh, probably uh, probably ten years ago uh, there was a big uh, uh, again a pandemic of H1N1 that happened, uh, or in a colloquial terms we call it swine flu. And that again kind of stopped the world, not at this extent as we are experiencing right now. But I still remember that uh, even in India uh, that time there was quite a lot of disturbance in life, uh, disturbance in school schedules, uh, disturbance in social life. Uh, so uh, that that's another great example. Well, and we def definitely need to talk about coronaviruses. I mean, uh, uh, this slide kind of shows us uh, all the known human coronaviruses. So uh, just a quick background. Coronaviruses uh, is a big, uh, big family of viruses where there are uh, probably each bat species. It is estimated that probably each bat species will have its own coronavirus. And as veterinarians, we actually know uh, so many coronaviruses. We have been treating cats with coronaviruses. We have been treating the dogs with their own coronaviruses. So uh, there are actually human coronaviruses and before SARS-2 coronavirus, there were uh, six, seven coronaviruses that were uh, already known to be uh, human, uh, already known to be infecting humans. And uh, all of them actually have uh, their natural host, either bats as their natural host or rodents as their bat natural host. And many of them, they also uh, tend to have intermediate hosts. More, for most of those viruses, we probably have not been able to identify. We have been able to identify uh, their intermediate hosts, but for some of them, we haven't been able to identify their intermediate hosts. And that's why it's really important, especially uh, to understand in the context of this epidemic of SARS coronavirus 2 is that many of us probably have already uh, uh, gone through uh, uh, a coronavirus infection when we got some kind of a common cold because uh, probably it is estimated that 25 percent of 25 uh, percent of common cold cases are due to some of the human coronaviruses so uh, so uh, that's that's one example of uh, coronavirus, and 
now let's let's come back to some some theory how how scientists are trying to theorize the emergence of these viruses from from wildlife to uh, wildlife to humans so just imagine there are uh, there are kind of three phases of the emergence of a virus and uh, this actually comes from uh, another paper uh, by Karesh et al. I forgot to put the put the citation over here, but uh, you can you can imagine that the viruses are kind of circulating within their wildlife hosts, and they are not they are not uh, jumping into humans. Uh, sometimes what might happen is that those viruses might jump into animal hosts that are very closely associated with those wildlife. Just take an example of Hendra virus. Uh, there were uh, horses that were uh, that were that were around uh, around bat colonies, and they were living in the same area where uh, bats are roosting, and uh, that's how they got in con got in contact with those uh, viruses excreted by those bats, and then they kind of amplified. So sometimes there is an involvement of a domestic or an intermediate host, as I was saying. And then whenever there is contact with humans and then there is evolutionary uh, evolutionary mutation that that might help jump the virus from humans to um, uh, from animals to humans, uh, you can see sometimes uh, localized emergence of these diseases. And a great example would be uh, would be the Nipah outbreak that happened in India. We probably know that it wasn't it wasn't uh, it imported from somewhere else, let's say from Bangladesh or from uh, Southeast Asia. This virus probably got emerged locally from the bats, bat species that are circulating in that region. So uh, similarly, the earlier outbreaks of Ebola virus uh, were a kind of localized emergence where you would see few chains of transmission between people, but after that, the after that the uh, uh, the outbreak would just die off and then sometimes uh, the 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 virus kind of gets uh, gets uh, I would say acclimatized for human to human transmission uh, either either through uh, evolutionary processes mutations or it is uh, just ready to uh, even before spillover it's probably have the abilities to infect humans really well. Uh, so that might take uh, uh, take the virus to the next level of emergence, which we probably would call as a pandemic emergence. And uh, 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 again, I just want to avoid talking a lot about SARS coronavirus too, uh, but uh, I'm giving examples of uh, of of uh, uh, pandemics that have happened previously through the same processes where uh, uh, the the infection eventually spread through other means such as people traveling one from one place to the other or probably birds carrying the virus from one place to the other or even just imagine uh, a mosquito species that is carrying that virus might expand its uh, distribution and start living very well in regions where it was not living previously and can easily then carry this that virus to a new region and that's how uh, the pandemic emergence can take place. And keep in mind that right now, uh, just before this COVID pandemic happened, we were uh, at a peak of global globalization where we uh, we were easily uh, traveling between places across the world. Probably, as they say that uh, in the last ten years, the uh, the the air travel that has increased is exponentially much more than what we were traveling probably uh, ten years ago. So all these factors are kind of uh, contributing to the emergence of these pandemic threats. And I was uh, I, I was uh, trying to explain in earlier slides is that not all the spillovers from wildlife reservoirs are uh, are you would say would eventually result into a, uh, an outbreak that is completely human to human. I mean, we know it the best as a veterinarians. Uh, as as veterinarians, we know that for rabies uh, to spill over from animals to humans, there has to be a dog bite, uh, or there has to be an animal contact uh, of humans with with who, who are infected with rabies. So not all the all the uh, spillovers are human to humans. Like for example, as this I'm trying to show here is that sometimes it might just go from 
uh, animals to humans and then there is there is no further transmission. Then uh, sometimes there is um, there are chains of smaller transmissions uh, as as shown here probably in this example actually uh, where uh, there, there might be few chains of human to human transmission. Uh, but some some viruses are very well adapted. They can start human to human transmission and then there is um, human to human transmission either uh, because of a vector or uh, just because of contact between humans. So uh, you can you can develop the theory as much as you want. So again coming back to uh, again coming back to the overall understanding of how these uh, uh, viruses are emerging and then what we can really do as we were talking that, uh, in previous couple of slides is that uh, there is a transmission uh, of these viruses in wildlife. Sometimes uh, the spillover can occur in domestic animals and those domestic animals can act as amplifying hosts. And eventually that leads to spillover into humans. And as shown in the red uh, part of the graph, once the, once the uh, spillover happens, there is a big, big outbreak of uh, that virus in humans. So what we really need to do is that we really need to control. We really need to uh, forecast here at the early stages of uh, the disease emergence. That's when, for example, it's it's likely to uh, likely to uh, jump into animal hosts or likely to jump into humans. And that is where our response should be so that as you can see that uh, then the uh, benefits would be uh, would be quite a lot by preventing so many human cases. So uh, that is the idea is, is that we are we able to kind of predict when which viruses and when they they will emerge from wildlife to humans. And uh, that is that is the core idea of the project that I am fortunate enough to be a part of. So um, this uh, really I'll come back to this slide again. Uh, right, so um, I'll come back to these two slides again, but I would ju I just want to uh, start uh, talking about the project that I'm I'm part of. Uh, uh, it's called as uh, a predict project. It is funded by uh, United States Agency for International Development and uh, the name of the project is called as predict and I was talking uh, about the concept that can we really uh, identify viruses way before uh, they even spill over into humans and can we uh, predict uh, detect those viruses and predict that these are some of the risky viruses that we should be worrying about and uh, uh, keeping that in keeping that uh, aim in in mind we started looking at what can we do. So going back to this slide over here again is that we really need to understand key human animal interfaces. So what I mean by animal human interfaces is that places or ecological conditions where we are interacting with wildlife. So it can be uh, it can be a cave. It can be a bat cave where uh, people might be going in and uh, harvesting bad guano. Uh, it can be a, a wet market uh, as uh, as we have seen in the case of uh, SARS coronavirus 2 that where people are buying or selling wild animals. It can be a, a wildlife reservoir or a national park where people are going as tourists or uh, farmers live right next to a national park where their domestic animals tend to have conflict with wild animals. So all these are key animal human interfaces. And what we did actually in a very recent study, as you can see, um, uh, this is one of our studies that got published in 2020 in uh, Proceedings of Royal Society B journal, is where uh, actually we looked at uh, all the known zoonotic viruses and their hosts and we started seeing uh, started understanding uh, what is the association of the IUCN classification. So as wildlife veterinarians, all of you know that International Union of Conservation of Nature 
kind of classifies all the species, all the mammals and bird species into least concerned, concerned, threatened, uh, uh, near threatened and extinct based on uh, how much how much uh, they are uh, they are under threat. Uh, so we started uh, identifying associations between uh, zoonotic number of zoonotic viruses uh, uh, present in in threatened taxa, present in least concerned taxa. And as you can see here, uh, different uh, different orders, taxonomical orders are shown here uh, yeah, or in, in this graph. You can see that most of the most number of uh, uh, most number of viruses are found in regions uh, in animals that are declining in their population uh, due to uh, deterioration of their habitat quality due to over exploitation of their populations through various processes, either through hunting, through uh, through destruction of their habitat. So what this tells us is that those are the key specific uh, animal human interfaces <clears throat> that we need to focus on and that we need to uh, uh, need to control so that uh, so that spillover from these interfaces uh, can be reduced dramatically. So uh, another study I want to uh, briefly talk about is a really interesting study uh, that I was leading uh, and completed about a couple of years ago. And here again, I want to just give you a brief and brief um, uh, brief, uh, I would say uh, introduction to how quickly these <coughs> these studies can become um, multidisciplinary. So we were talking about uh, the Zika virus outbreak that happened four years ago. And the question that scientists were trying to uh, uh, understand is that, OK, now the uh, Zika virus has emerged in South America. So can can uh, uh, primate species in South America get uh, Zika virus from humans and can can they start circulating Zika viruses within themselves? Uh, and what will happen to their population? And if if it's going to affect them, uh, clinically, if they're going to uh, start dying, all those questions. And it's also important to know that if they keep circulating the virus within themselves, even we control the infection in humans, eventually it's going to come back again from wildlife to humans. So it's really important to identify key flavivirus species. So uh, this over here, the dendrogram, as you can see, uh, has a uh, we, we we basically went into the literature and for all the flaviviruses that are listed over here, they're all zoonotic flaviviruses. And you can see a tiny Zika virus over here, a tiny yellow fever virus over here. Uh, some of you might be familiar with the dengue virus. Uh, some of you might be familiar with West Nile virus, those who are in the Western part of the world. Some of you might be, of course, Japanese encephalitis is very well known. So all these are, uh, and then the Kayasnur forest that I was talking about, that virus. So all these viruses uh, are zoonotic flaviviruses. So we went into the literature and identified key avian and mammalian species that can harbor these, these uh, viruses. And uh, using some machine learning models, uh, as I was saying that as, as veterinary epidemiologist, you just don't uh, restrict yourself to key uh, specific uh, skills, but you have to expand your your uh, skill sets. Uh, we actually started using machine learning models to predict hosts that might uh, that might harbor uh, these uh, these flaviviruses. So we were able to kind of predict what are the species uh, harboring, let's say here in uh, in uh, as you can see in this graph in South America, where where are those species uh, more 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 frequent? So we realize that in South Southeast Asia, there might be high diversity of species that might harbor uh, these flaviviruses. So uh, that's that's uh, these kind of studies are kind of really important to plan your surveillance. So imagine now you have to go out in the field. Uh, uh, in in whichever part you're working in the world, and you have to start uh, uh, start surveillance of a specific uh, flavivirus, then you can kind of uh, go through the uh, these lists lists that we have created. 
uh, and start sampling those uh, as a priority species versus uh, going out there uh, randomly and not knowing anything about their ecology. So uh, these kinds of studies help us uh, plan future surveillance, uh, especially when it is at large scale. So uh, with this, uh, I really want to start talking about the, pro uh, the project that I'm part of. Uh, as I said, it's a USAID funded predict, predict project. And the aim of this project is to identify viral threats from wildlife even before they are emerging into humans. So uh, the strategy that this, this project has been uh, kind of uh, implementing in doing the surveillance is a One Health surveillance idea. And uh, I think it's, uh, it's uh, uh, very safe to say as veterinarians, uh, we are the ones who have kind of uh, come up with the concept of One Health. And uh, I think in, in next uh, 10, 20 years, we will be the one who will be uh, pushing, pushing out the concept of One Health and uh, uh, showing the world how One Health surveillances can be done and what, what is the importance of uh, this One Health approach. So the way we kind of did the One Health surveillance uh, all across the world, almost in 34 countries uh, for last 10 years, is that we identified those key animal human interfaces and how how was that identified <clears throat> based on the studies that i just showed previously that we we were able to kind of come up with key human animal interfaces where we think that uh, spillover might happen <clears throat> so just imagine uh, a community of people living in a village and they have uh, they are living right next to bats they have uh, rodents that are uh, raiding their crops or uh, crop storages, and there might be some primates that are in the nearby forest. So these are uh, key uh, animal human interfaces, and we have to kind of survey those animals, uh, different taxa. They will be domestic animals. They will be uh, those wild animals, primates, rodents, bats, but at the same time, we also need to do surveillance in humans because uh, if there is uh, if there is a virus or a disease that is transmitting from wildlife to humans, that needs to uh, that need that needs to be detected at the same time. So uh, this project actually was a big partnership between wildlife sectors of different countries, livestock sectors of different countries, and human human medical sectors of those countries. So for example, uh, we we worked almost, as I was saying, almost in uh, 34 countries all across the world. In each of those countries, we did partner with the wildlife departments. So for example, in India, it was, it was the forest department we uh, collaborated with, uh, and then the livestock department of the state and a, a medical college or a medical university in that region and did the surveillance all together. So that's really uh, the approach that the project has taken over the last 10 years. And uh, as I was saying that it's just not about uh, uh, about doing the surveillance, but it also is about uh, teaching the local vets, local scientists how to do these studies. Because as you know that uh, uh, doing any kind of surveillance in wildlife is probably one of the most challenging things in the world. Uh, let alone uh, catching a wild, wild animal, uh, even seeing a wild animal is probably one of the hardest things. And we know that uh, in, in, in the forests, uh, some of the forests can become very remote, uh, detecting us, uh, even seeing uh, or even hearing species can be hard. So training the local uh, staff is really important. First of all, uh, to do the work locally. Uh, local uh, scientists, local wildlife experts are the real experts for that region. So it's really important to understand their, uh, their concepts behind uh, what could be the key human animal interfaces, what are the key species that are interacting with people, so on and so forth. And they are kind of the first uh, frontier responders to any kind of outbreak. 
and that has been now shown uh, very well. Uh, some of our teams actually responded to the COVID-19 outbreak, uh, especially when, uh, for example, in Nepal, our team uh, was the first one uh, to detect a positive case in Nepal. So uh, they they had been trained by uh, the their their lab lab folks have been trained by uh, the teams uh, f during our uh, during our project. So uh, this this has been going on not just in Asia, but we have so many countries in Africa, uh, many countries in Southeast Asia, and uh, uh, five years ago we were also working significantly in South America. So uh, as as you can see that uh, we were kind of trying to collect samples from wild animals and not just uh, wild animals, but as well as from humans. Uh, but then there is also one key aspect that is that need that needs to be addressed. And uh, the uh, it's it's about understanding how people behave when it comes uh, to when it comes to uh, uh, their behavior uh, along with wildlife. So we also kind of uh, started doing risk investigations uh, which are behavioral in nature. So we went out and started asking questions about how they handle animals, uh, whether they have any kind of a risk perception. Do they feel that is it risky to handle a wildlife without any proper PPE uh, uh, involvement, so on and so forth. So this also helps us uh, devise what could be uh, the preventive measures? Uh, because as you know that even a simple simple thing like wear masks all the time is really hard to put. Uh, uh, the behavioral change is really hard for humans to adapt to. Hence, uh, uh, suggesting a behavioral change uh, for people who have been living with wildlife for generations is is really hard and we need to understand what's really happening, uh, why they are behaving the way they are behaving. So we also kind of involve social scientists in these projects and they help us. Uh, uh, they help us prescribe uh, interventions that are behaviorally possible, socially uh, uh, possible in those regions. So as I was talking about the surveillance that we are we are conducting and this actually graph shows uh, the whole effort that we have been doing, we we have tested more than 100,000 uh, animals all across the world, wild animals all across the world, and they most of them were, as you can see here, uh, most of them were bats because we know that bats carry more viruses uh, than non-human primates, of course, because they are very closely associated with us and rodents, because rodents are also another taxa that tend to have uh, quite a lot of viruses. We live uh, very closely with uh, rodents. Uh, of course, birds, domestic animals, and there was some other wildlife that we also sampled. And uh, along with 100,000 uh, wild animals across the world, we also tested about 30,000 humans at the same time in a One Health uh, realm. So what it really means is that we concurrently sampled wildlife so we would go out today in in a in a region which is right next to a forest uh, sample monkeys over there and next day in the same uh, same region in the same village we would uh, sample humans to detect if there is any kind of sharing uh, between of pathogens between uh, those two uh, communities uh, and we were kind of focusing only on five viral families uh, of of those were as of course, uh, filoviruses. Filoviruses is the Ebola virus family. Uh, flaviviruses, which includes, as I as I just showed, all all the Zika virus, yellow fever, dengue, all the important uh, viruses. Coronaviruses. I don't need to talk a lot about coronaviruses. Uh, influenza viruses and paramyxoviruses. <clears throat> as paramyxoviruses, we also know that. Uh, as veterinarians, we know that they are quite important in terms of human health as well as animal health. So uh, these, so we collected these animal samples and tried to uh, and tested them for detection of new viruses. And during these 10 years, we actually detected more than 900 new viruses that we have detected for the first time in, in the history of humankind. 
So that is a great addition to our knowledge or understanding of uh, the whole viral diversity these species can harbor. And as you can see, uh, there are some key uh, interesting sampling techniques that we implemented. So I think uh, I ju I'm just uh, selecting uh, examples from uh, from Asia mostly because uh, I I thought that most of the participants would be from Asia. Uh, is is how how do we sample uh, macaques in in Nepal? Most of you probably might know that if we go out and start darting these monkeys, it's really hard. Uh, if you dart one monkey, other monkeys would never come to you, or they they never come never they will never come close to you. They are very quick learners. So uh, uh, this is this is one of our sites where we were doing our surveillance for last ten years. Is the Pashupatina Temple in Kathmandu? So uh, this temple has so many monkeys all around, uh, and they interact with humans. So again, it is kind of uh, an important uh, uh, human-animal interface. So uh, and you can see that they are just around there uh, congregated. So what we basically did was that we uh, developed a new method of sampling these monkeys. Uh, so as you can see that there is something like a chew stick that we developed and that chew stick basically was dipped into uh, mango juice and was given to those monkeys and those monkeys would take it and they would chew it and they will just suck all the juice juice out of it because it it tastes good and once the juice is out they would just throw that out the stick out but you can pick up the stick and then you have the saliva samples from these monkeys. So all these methods were tested, uh, they were standardized, and we were able to kind of uh, sample these monkeys for last 10 years to detect new viruses in their saliva. So that is how uh, sam uh, that is how we have been sampling monkeys uh, across different uh, different countries. So uh, it's just not uh, um, it's very uh, innovative. You have to come up with uh, interesting, interesting techniques, uh, new ways to deal with your problems, and then you can get away with uh, some nice results. So, uh, as I was telling, I just want to show some key viral discoveries uh, from from this project uh, for almost ten years. Uh, so, the first important discovery is of a new Ebola virus. So we actually discovered a new Ebola virus for the first time ever. And this was discovered in a bat species in Sierra Leone. And this Ebola virus is yet to uh, infect humans. So we now know a species that, a species of virus that probably have a high potential to infect humans, but is yet to jump into humans. So fortunately, uh, this hasn't this hasn't happened yet, but just imagine that. Unfortunately, if this new uh, Ebola virus uh, virus emerge into humans and start um, start causing outbreaks, we already know about the virus. We can quickly generate a vaccine. We can quickly basically detect it because we can now generate PCR uh, a PCR test for these viruses, and so on and so forth. And we have detected so many MERS and SARS like viruses in Africa and Asia. So we are uh, increasing our understanding of coronaviruses uh, in, in these regions. Uh, and and even in humans, we have detected so many uh, pathogens that are of importance to public health uh, from a public health perspective. So these are some key viral discoveries that we have been doing. But eventually it also comes down to uh, communicating the risk. We know that uh, uh, telling people uh, uh, telling people uh, to do simple things, simple changes in their behavior is really hard. So uh, so we have been uh, developing material that can go to these communities in which we are working uh, where we can tell them how to let's say live safely with bats. So there was this uh, there was this uh, small uh, information informational kind of pamphlet that was created and that that pamphlet is now translated into almost 12 different languages local languages and uh, this actually has 
uh, this actually has been generated by the local communities. It's just that we provided them uh, provided them with uh, uh, with with the expertise with respect to uh, uh, designing graphic designing so and so forth. So it's uh, it's it's coming from the communities on how we can uh, 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 how we can tell communities to live safely with bats. Uh, it's really important uh, to understand here is that uh, decimating wild population just because they might be uh, a risk to human health is is not a great great idea uh, first of all it's i mean it's not a great idea in terms of uh, it's definitely not a great idea in terms of uh, the biodiversity issue the ecological aspects of it but it also not great idea in terms of our public health it has been uh, it has been proven in many studies that reducing the diversity of a wildlife diversity in a region actually makes us more vulnerable to new diseases and that's because these wildlife species these uh, um, uh, diverse species can actually act as uh, act as sinkholes for these infections and if those species are not present uh, viruses or pathogens will find humans as will try to find humans as their hosts and will try to infect humans because it's it's uh, it's eventually an evolutionary game where uh, viruses also need to survive and they will do whatever they need to do to uh, to survive and they will find some kind of host and most of the time the hosts will be humans so it's it's really uh, not a great idea to for example cut down all the trees where bats are living and that actually hampers the whole ecological balance of that system and increases the uh, vulnerability for humans to get new infections. So uh, there are some other studies that we are also doing uh, using these viruses. So just imagine uh, uh, this is one of probably very complicated studies, but I just want to kind of go go over it is uh, just imagine on the left side here you can see uh, different dots and each dot is represented by a known virus and uh, there is a connection between those two viruses when those viruses are found in the same host. So this is you can call it as Facebook network of viruses and uh, some of these viruses are sharing a lot of friends with other viruses because they have same hosts so and so forth. So uh, what's what's really interesting is that we can see where are new viruses, new predict viruses, those 900 viruses that we have discovered kind of fall within that network. And what are what associations it will generate with our known viruses? So this is what the predicted network kind of looks like and within which the white dots are our predict viruses, our new predict viruses. And you can see since uh, you can see that these are the key uh, viruses, the one one that are really big in in the size, so that might be uh, that those viruses might be playing an important role in the in the whole ecology of viruses and their hosts. So this is what we call as macroecological perspective towards towards this problem, and uh, that that might help us also understand. Uh, what are the key viruses that we have found from from the last 10 years of surveillance and we kind of are able to rank those species it's it's just like uh, imagine uh, you are friends uh, you're you're on facebook and facebook tells you is this also your friend because uh, you are friends with so and so so that's how uh, that it's 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 based on the social network theory uh, that we are trying to understand what could be the key new viruses. So uh, along with that, now the teams have start uh, started to categorize those viruses. They are they are trying to do uh, laboratory studies for some of those viruses that we think are important in terms of public health. We are trying to understand whether these viruses can infect, let's say, uh, uh, let's say human cell cultures whether uh, they can infect uh, primate cell cultures. So doing some uh, laboratory work is also key in understanding the risk for these new viruses. And uh, 
of course, uh, as I was saying that many of these studies are helping us develop targeted wildlife surveillance. Uh, similar to uh, similar to this, uh, this project, uh, this predict project. Now uh, there, there is a talk of developing global virome project where uh, we can go out in the wild and sample all the species and try to detect all the viruses within within uh, those species. And it sounds ambitious, but I think uh, similar to uh, probably 20 years ago when a human genome project was declared, that sounded ambitious as well. And uh, hence probably doing, trying to uh, do such kind of endeavors might not be a, a bad idea in the future. So for that, we really need to start developing targeted wildlife surveillance for emerging uh, infectious diseases. And as I said, that coming back to the final uh, kind of, I think we are in the final stages of the presentation. Now we kind of know what are the key viruses that we need to focus on in the early stages of this transmission. And hence we can kind of detect those viruses early and respond very rapidly even before they are kind of infecting humans. So uh, finally, just, uh, trying to understand the overall uh, ecology of these viruses is important. So for example, you, you know that now this is our, uh, you just imagine a toy model of how uh, transmission might be happening. There is, uh, a, you, there is transmission of uh, viruses within animals. Then you can, uh, you can see there is uh, animal human spillover. And once there is a spillover, then there is a, a human transmission within humans. So uh, as, as veterinarians, where do we stand? So we really need to understand that, especially at these two stages, occurrence of zoonotic uh, diseases in animal host uh, and uh, the uh, animal human spillover is where the field work, the, <coughs> uh, the wildlife veterinarians uh, job is I think very crucial for uh, to develop, to understand all these uh, systems, we really need to have great data from field that can go into these models, that can help us understand uh, and develop these models and even test some of these models in the field. So for example, just knowing how long, let's say SARS coronavirus 2 uh, is shed by a bat species, we don't know yet. Uh, how, how does it, uh, spread from one bat to another bat. Uh, we know now we know quite a lot about how it transmit between people, but how does it transmit from one bat to another bat? Does it transmit be between one bat species to another bat species? We don't know. So there are innumerable questions that needs to be addressed. Uh, and I think wildlife veterinarians are the best poised to collect those types of data. They have the skills, they have the understanding of wildlife uh, and and uh, they even understand the diseased, uh, diseased uh, part of it as well. So that's why probably wildlife veterinarians are key to all these processes. Finally, just want to uh, thank the whole team. Uh, the whole project is a huge project and you can see that uh, this is just a core team of over here, a huge core team of scientists from all across the world. So I'm just fortunate enough to share you with you all the story of this uh, uh, USAID Predict project. Uh, along with that, just want to thank all my uh, mentors who have been helping me develop my research, uh, uh, who have been funding our research. Uh, and I think just eventually just want to highlight the importance of One Health. Uh, it's it's key to look at all the uh, health problems uh, from the uh, One Health approach. Uh, it, the key important things are like antibiotic resistance that might be a bigger issue in coming years. Of course, zoonotic diseases. There's so many di zoonotic diseases, environmental health issues, uh, environmental and even some social issues can be uh, can be approached uh, through a one health uh, uh, paradigm so uh, just want to say thank you for the opportunity uh, those who are interested please follow me on my twitter account we 
try to share interesting stories and interesting uh, things over there. And uh, yeah, I'm happy to take any questions if there are any. Uh, thank you, Dr. Pranav. It was really wonderful presentation. And uh, let me just uh, read out the feedback that we have received so far. I mean, I can't read all of them, for, but for example, there's one from which says nice presentation. There's no name. And again, no name. Good evening. Very informative uh, seminar. Dr. Suman Mahal, very nice PowerPoint presentation. Then uh, Dr. Kavita Khilare, excellent presentation, Pranav. It seems the ma'am knows you. Uh, Dr. Mm -hmm. Anjan Kumar Sahu, uh, assistant professor from uh, Bhubaneswar. He also says nice presentation. Dr. Jayant Patel says nice presentation. Dr. Jay Prakash, very informative session. It is very informative and relevant by another person who has not given his name. And there are more similar ones. All right. And I really have to say that it was really a good presentation because not many are talking or researching on these things. We do have clinical presentations, webinars going on, but uh, these are equally important and there are less of, I mean, you know, I would rather request the organizing team to get more mm -hmm. of such uh, informative sessions. And hopefully, if you are free, maybe in the future, maybe we'll have one more better session from you. Sure. Uh, okay, let's get to the questions. We do have a lot of questions. Uh, the, the many of them are related to the COVID that we are facing. Let me read out the question because once that is done, I guess we can skip the other questions related to the COVID. One sec. Okay, what is your perspective on the epidemiological progress of the COVID-19? Right, I think uh, especially with uh, when it comes to human epidemiology, uh, the data is uh, increasingly pouring in. So our understanding about how the disease uh, behaves in humans is increasing day by day. Uh, I think it's we still don't know where exactly it came from. Uh, in terms of its exact bat species, whether there was an involvement of intermediate host, and even though we have an understanding of uh, it happened somewhere around the Wuhan market, we don't know whether the transmission, the ex the the act of a spillover from animals to humans occurred at Wuhan market, or uh, someone was already infected came to Wuhan market and then spread it to people. So uh, from from those perspective, I think uh, especially from the animals side, uh, it's still uh, lacking the epidemiological understanding. OK, uh, the next one is from Dr. Dr. S.J. Tripathi. Uh, when do we classify a virus as a new virus? OK, so that's a amazing, great question. So uh, it's uh, it's really uh, different for each viral families. So uh, for the predict project uh, there, uh, because we were uh, detecting those viruses using uh, a PCR method called as consensus PCR, within which actually we are uh, trying to uh, amplify smaller portions of uh, uh, the nucleotide sequence that we assume is uh, consistent throughout a viral family. And uh, we so we try to see how much, how does it match with uh, known viruses? And uh, I think, uh, for example, uh, for some viral families, I don't know the exact numbers on top of my head, but some viral families, if the virus is different than 95% of the nucleotide for that PCR, uh, section then we uh, try to call it new virus then uh, for some viral families it's 97 uh, percent uh, uh, same and then the remaining part is different so those thresholds are different for different viral families but given that it's uh, also important to know that uh, viral classification is eventually determined by uh, international body called as uh, international commission of taxonomy of viruses so the uh, these new uh, recordings then go to those experts and it's a peer review uh, throughout the world that happens and then though uh, 
that committee kind of eventually declares it as a taxonomical new entity of virus species. Okay, thanks. Uh, there's another question from Dr. M. Raman Tanuwas. Uh, you mentioned about the One Health Surveillance Project for the scientists. So what is your overall takeaway message? I think uh, the takeaway message for a One Health project is uh, keep uh, that uh, the research has to be interdisciplinary. Uh, it's really important to start developing communications with our medical professionals, uh, colleagues from medical professionals, and uh, that is uh, very important to begin with. So uh, I think that's that's the first uh, key takeaway message from my side. Okay. Uh, another question from Dr. Mahesh Rangnekar. Uh, how to prevent spread of viral infection from migratory birds? Is there any SOP your institute has developed to monitor viral threats from migratory birds, especially waterfalls? Yes, so uh, we uh, definitely have uh, uh, testing protocols that are uh, that we have developed and they are free for everyone to use. Uh, especially when it comes to a waterfowl, it's uh, uh, it's up uh, the threat is about influenza viruses. Uh, along with that, there is great uh, uh, OIE and even WHO have great uh, uh, ways to improve the biosafety of our poultry. So I think that is the key interface, uh, waterfowl and poultry, where uh, the transmission of avian influenza generally takes place. So uh, definitely uh, those are the two key areas using new techniques uh, and sampling those wild birds regularly and then improving our bio biosafety at poultry. OK, uh, another question is uh, related to the unknown. Uh, what factor? I mean, there are a lot of factors which are unknown, you know, still. So the uh, overall, the, the guy, the guy he's not given his name. He wished to know what factor influences the interspecies transmission? I mean, they're mostly unknown, but is there a time frame or something since the COVID has come, the people or the scientists are working hard. So is there a time frame where more of these unknown factors, you know, would be uncovered and we will understand better about how this, I mean, how these transmissions they really work? I think uh, it, it again uh, depends on the uh, effort that we are doing. For example, as I was telling about uh, Ebola viruses, uh, we still, uh, we know Ebola virus since almost 50 years now, but we still don't know what are the species that it's coming from. But uh, really, sometimes it's easier to detect some uh, viruses early and identify their hosts just because we have already established surveillance system. So uh, I think there is more collaborative research that's going on uh, around the region in China to uh, identify those host species. So there might be a chance that we will be able to identify how it eventually uh, jumped into humans. Okay. Another question from Dr. Prashant Kadam. He wished to know, I mean, how you envision the composition, like the qualification in terms of specialization of the people that you're going to take to, to make a task for to tackle the, you know, these pandemics or for surveillance. So, I mean, you know, it would be helpful for him for the administration to build up a qualified team. So what kind of composition in terms of specialization that you recommend? That That is a great question. So I think, uh, first of all, we really need to have vets and even within vets, we need to have expertise. Uh, we need wildlife veterinarians. We need veterinarians who uh, are, are livestock veterinarians and work in those remote parts where uh, these interaction takes place. Then we definitely need expertise in community medicine from uh, the human side uh, who are uh, who are working in those communities. And then not just not just that we need lab uh, expertise. We need people who can work with viruses, who can detect those, who can uh, process those samples, who can uh, use uh, new new uh, detection techniques, uh, new PCR methods and protocols. We need a sociologist because this is a very uh, social issue. Uh, just take an example of Ebola virus. Like most of uh, in, in certain parts of Africa, uh, there were some burial methods uh, that were very uh, traditional to those communities. And uh, eventually scientists started realizing that there is some transmission that is happening during the burial process of uh, the victims. 
So uh, even uh, so changing those behaviors is a very sensitive issue. So we need people who understand the society really well and who can communicate with the society very well. We are uh, very good within ourselves. We can communicate with veterinary friends. We can communicate with our medical friends uh, very easily with our uh, jargons and with our uh, knowledge, uh, just technical terms. But uh, it's really important to have someone who can implement those changes in the community. And definitely the involvement of community members is very key. Without them, you cannot even go out and uh, do anything. So these probably are the four areas where we need expertise to develop a One Health team. Great. Uh, you mentioned about the two sticks that you have been using for the rhesus case. So are there any concerns of cross contamination? Say if, if those sticks are thrown away by monkeys and picked up by other monkeys? Right, so that does happen and then uh, we don't use them for testing. We try to basically quickly uh, recover if a monkey kind of throws it out. So uh, yeah, that does happen. If uh, two or three monkeys are chewing on it, we would then, uh, and if we really still need the sample, we would not call it an individual sample, but kind of a pooled sample from two, three uh, individuals. Okay, this is Dr. Sanjay Potwal. He is a graduate student from Nepal and he's planning to do some research on wildlife and domestic animal conflict in Chitwan National Park, which is in Nepal. So he's asking, can he get in touch with Dr. Pranav for further discussion? I think you already have shared your Twitter, right? So yes. he can get in touch with you via Twitter. So that's done. And uh, there's still a lot of questions. I just have to go through them. Just one sec. Okay, from Dr. Rajkumar Jadav, have your institution ever come up with the recommendations? Uh, I mean, regarding not to house particular species of animal in zoos, owning to potential risk of zoonosis? Uh, no, not from our institute uh, ourselves, but it's uh, definitely uh, right now people are worried more about bats, especially for COVID. Uh, so um, I think internationally, uh, Many international organizations have asked to stop working with bats for a while because uh, the fear is that we might kind of uh, spill back the COVID infection into bat species and we don't want our bats to kind of harbor uh, uh, COVID-19 uh, within our regions. Uh, for other species, it has been uh, what I know uh, of is that even though we can detect some of uh, some species positive by PCR, they are probably not uh, spreading the infection uh, further and not showing many uh, serious clinical signs. So I think uh, there is no great recommendation otherwise. Okay. Uh, follow up question from Dr. S.J. Tripadi, Mumbai. Isn't the process of uh, such surveillance itself is a risk for such exposures? That's right. So uh, the, the even uh, like in our studies where we are, we were trying to identify the key interfaces. Uh, research is one of the key interface. So uh, making sure that we are wearing PPE uh, when we go out in the field uh, is all all really important. Mm -hmm. And uh, th there have been uh, previous uh, occasions when people actually got infected during the surveillance work. Okay, uh, another question uh, sounds interesting from Dr. Sujay Das Gupta. Have we transmitted any viral disease to domestic animals, which in turn has transmitted to wild animals? We are only talking about wild animals to domestic to humans so far. But, you know, has it ever happened vice versa? Uh, that's an interesting question. We definitely have uh, spillback occurrences uh, into wildlife and just into uh, domestic animals. I think. Uh, I might be wrong, but uh, there is a, a tuberculosis strain that went from animals uh, from humans to animals in livestock, but I doubt that has gone back into wild. Uh, there is uh, definitely there are many instances when it happened just from humans to wildlife. Like uh, there are some uh, uh, mountain gorillas in in uh, Central Africa in Rwanda where uh, where because so many tourists actually go uh, hike 
they do a trek and they go and see those uh, gorillas uh, and those gorillas have been found uh, positive for many some human infections so that's when the spillback has happened directly from humans to wildlife but i i can't think of anything that has happened from humans livestock and wildlife uh, there are a few questions. I mean, he, uh, Dr. Dhruv Desai, he's a PhD fellow veterinarian. Uh, veterinary, he's doing PhD in veterinary microbiology right now. I think this, he's, asked, he's asked the same question multiple times. Uh, it's like, what's your perspective on epidemiological pro process, progress of COVID? I mean, that has been covered. And the issue of what happens here is, I mean, uh, uh, the, all the questions they come in the moderation, so they don't they don't see whether they're published or not. So they, they sometimes right. feel that the question has not gone, so they keep on asking the same question. That's right. No but this this question we have already covered here. I think uh, there are, there are still a lot of questions. I mean, you would also be able to see them, but uh, one way or the other, either they have been covered in the presentation or we have just covered uh, them just now. So I guess thanks a lot, uh, Dr. Pranav, for your time. I'll just uh, go back to the organizing team so that they can take the event forward. Thank you. Thank you.